Thank you for joining us today for this uh, tool training on the performance-based engineering application that we developed. During this training, or during the three days, to be more precise, you are going to learn how to use uh, this tool. You can see that there are a bunch of settings available uh, on multiple tabs, and you will learn how to use this application to get uh, results on uh, losses and damages for a building structure uh, that you can analyze all the way from selecting ground motions, uh, specifying the structural model, and then uh, calculating and specifying the damages and losses. You can get these kinds of uh, overview or summary statistics, and we will also show you how to get more detailed results, like such uh, histograms or joint distributions of various decision variables. Now, the structure of this three-day uh, training is uh, on the slide now. Uh, we will start with an introduction today, so uh, we will not go deep into any particular aspect of loss assessment. My objective today is to show you how to use the application, and uh, you should be able to run a simple example by the end of the day, basically by the end of this hour. And tomorrow we will go into more advanced uh, topics and issues, and I will show you how to use some of the more complex features in the application. I'm going to point out today which features uh, those are, so you will know what you can learn tomorrow. And on Wednesday, we will go and uh, talk about Pelican. Pelican is the engine behind the PBE application, so it's the back end, if you uh, want to think about it like that. Uh, those of you who are doing research where you need to do uh, these types of loss assessments at scale, so you want to run thousands of buildings, for example, might find it interesting to learn about Pelican and run these assessments uh, without a user interface, without a desktop application, so straight from MATLAB or, or whatever uh, script you prefer. So that's the structure of the three days. Uh, as you can see, we start at a high level and we are going deeper and deeper day by day. So I hope you will stay with us for all three days and learn about uh, the tools that we put together. Now, first, let me remind you of uh, how to set up and prepare the environment for these examples. I hope you either have done it already or you will do it after the presentation so that you can check out the examples that I prepared for you. Uh, if you have joined us last week and uh, set up your environment already for the Sim Center applications, then uh, please don't forget to upgrade your Pelican installation. I have it highlighted here. Uh, just run this in the terminal or in a command line and uh, your system will be updated automatically. This is important for you to get uh, the same results and oh, the same features that I'm showing you today. We have updated Pelican last week, so that's why this is important. Um, you can download the tool from DesignSafe. Uh, if you have these slides available, these slides are also uh, on DesignSafe, then you have links, direct links to the, to the tool. A zip file and the examples are also available on design safe so all of those should be available to you already and then i also have two reminders here for the online documentation of the tool and uh, the message board that we have and we encourage everyone to visit and share your feedback with us there so while some of you might be doing these steps to get ready for the examples i would like to spend a few minutes to give you some context for the pbe tool and for Sim Center in general. I know that some of you have been with us last week and probably have seen something like this already, uh, but probably not all of you. So I think it's important for everyone to understand who we are and uh, why we are developing these tools. It's gonna be just a few minutes, I promise. So the Sim Center uh, is an NSF funded project. We, uh, our main mission is to develop and integrate tools and methods to better understand and mitigate the effects of natural disasters through advanced computational simulation. And we like to say that we are grounded in the present. We have a five-year focus, but we really have a 20-year vision and we wanna see where this profession is going in the next 20 years and provide the tools and, uh, and computational simulation methods that will help us as a community get there. So what does this really mean? How, what, what are we doing already? I have a few examples for you. 
One of the things that we do is we create complex workflows and make them publicly available. This is very important to facilitate research in regional natural hazard risk management. And two examples here that are tools that are already available to you is a test bed that we have in the San Francisco Bay Area and another test bed for Atlantic City in New Jersey. You might notice that Atlantic City is not really an earthquake prone region. So that test bed is focusing on hurricanes. And this shows that we are not only focused on earthquake hazards, although so far in the tool trainings, we have mostly talked about earthquakes, but we are really looking at a suite of natural hazards and hurricane winds are already part of our uh, whole workflows. So we can do hurricane wind risk assessment already. And another thing that you can notice if you look at these figures is that we are having high resolution results. So we are interested in building level resolution, even at a regional scale. You can see that both for the Bay Area testbed and for the Atlantic City testbed. So uh, this is one of the uh, objectives that we have to improve these regional assessments and provide these tools for the community for free. We do this by developing open source and extensible tools for researchers and connecting these tools with high performance computing resources to facilitate high fidelity simulations and uncertainty quantification. Uncertainty quantification is a very important topic and we would like everyone to be able to run those uh, computationally expensive simulations that are required to quantify uncertainty. What we do is we are not developing every tool and every uh, software that is required for these simulations, but we look at what's available already in the community and we basically package this software by providing a preprocessor and a postprocessor around it so that we can standardize the data flow from the beginning of the workflow all the way until uh, loss assessment and hopefully soon also recovery simulation. So the way we think about it is that we create these puzzle pieces and create a modular work workflow that connects to an uncertainty quantification framework so that the uncertainty can be quantified all along and propagated all along the workflow. And then we will be able to see uh, how the decision variables that are available at the end are affected by the various inputs and their uncertainty uh, at each step of the way. Another important detail is the supporting databases. We are actively developing and collecting data to support all of these tools because another important issue that will come up also today is that even though we have great frameworks for uh, response simulation or loss assessment, unless we have information about the buildings, and information about the fragility of those buildings, we are not really able to do much with those frameworks. So we are trying to uh, get to the next level here as well by assembling those databases and then also providing it to you for free. Now, how, how are these tools connected to each other? I think this is also quite important. You will see that I'm going to build on the trainings that we had last week. So I'm not going to repeat much of the information from there because there's a lot of things that I would like to talk about that are related to damage and losses. So we don't have time to go into things that we already explained last week. If you didn't have a chance to join us last week, I pointed out which uh, trainings covered which tools. So you will be able to go back and watch those trainings if you are interested in those details. Now, the way our uh, applications are structured is kind of like a hierarchy. So we have a backend uh, application uh, set, and we build desktop applications on top of those. QoFam is our basic application that's, that's controlling uh, our uncertainty quantification in all of the others, basically. So you can see that it builds on these two backends uh, and backend applications. And we covered that in a two-day training last week. Now, on top of QoFam, we can build EEUQ, which is our earthquake engineering response simulation application. And you can see that it uses much more pieces from the backend. And we covered that last week for three days. So you can go and take a look at those videos if you are interested. Now, today we are going one step further 
building PBE on top of EUQ and QOFM. So it's using everything that was available here, but adds the loss assessment piece by uh, taking advantage of Pelican and the loss databases. So you can see how it's nicely building up uh, to a more and more complex tool, but all of the applications have a similar look and feel, so you should be able to move between them uh, quite easily. Now, there are a couple of other applications that will make this figure a bit more complicated, because as I mentioned, we are looking at, we are not only looking at earthquake hazards, but we have other hazards uh, included in this project, and we would like to uh, provide this kind of connection between the different communities in, in this uh, field. So VUQ is our wind engineering application that also builds on QOFM and is going to be linked to PBE. So we will have loss assessment for uh, wind hazards uh, by the end of this year. And this application will also have a corresponding tool training at the beginning of July. There are two other tools that we are developing that I'm only going to mention really briefly here. It's the uh, Hydro UQ, which is our water hazard uh, response, water related uh, damage and, and response estimation tool. And then uh, our crown jewel is what's built on the PBE, is our regional loss estimation tool. Both of these are going to be released at the end of the year. So this is how our, our framework is built up. And even if you are only interested in regional loss assessment, it might make sense for you to go and learn the relevant paths so that by the time you get to the regional tool, you will have all the inputs and uh, all, the, all the models uh, tested and you understand how they work and how they work together. So this is, about how the tools are connected together. Another thing that is unique about the Sim Center is how we are allowing you to run these simulations locally and then effortlessly transition into running them on a supercomputer. As I mentioned, uncertainty quantification and often just response simulation in general is, is very computationally expensive. So without running it on a supercomputer, you, you would be forced to either simplify your analysis or wait a long time. And oftentimes people are uh, reluctant to move to the cloud or to move to a supercomputer because of the additional uh, overhead that, that it requires when it comes to developing the models or changing how they are running at that uh, other platform. So what we are developing here is platform independent. Everything that we make runs on Windows and uh, Mac OS. Uh, as a front end, and our back end runs also on Unix systems. So that's why we can easily take your inputs and run it on another platform without needing to change anything. So, what we do is we are connecting with DesignSafe, another project that is supported by the Natu uh, National Sci Science Foundation, and we are preparing the models and the, and the simulation methods and they are providing the data storage and the high performance computing uh, resources to run these uh, simulations. And this is a very important distinction between the two projects. Uh, so it's important to understand what's the role of DesignSafe. And oftentimes DesignSafe is uh, mixed with SimCenter and I think it's not really clear in the community what the role of each uh, project is. So that's why I prepared this slide. And the next one, which shows you that actually the National Science Foundation supports a couple of projects under the NERI umbrella and Sim Center and DesignSafe are only two of them. So we are working with all of these projects and understanding what the needs are in the community and trying to serve those needs as best we can. The last thing that I wanted to mention about our activities is that we are also uh, considering it a priority to build a community around computer simulation in natural hazards engineering. I believe that without a community, this is, very, this is a very difficult problem to tackle. It, it's, it requires a lot of complex modules and it's very hard to uh, build such a workflow as a PhD student or even as a single research group. So we can get much further 
if we work together and share the tools we have and share our uh, expertise with each other. So for this reason, we organize workshops, we organize tool trainings like this one, a programming bootcamp every summer. We have a summer REU program for uh, undergraduates, educational applications, and also a state of art report where we collect what is available in the community uh, for performing these computational simulations. Among these efforts, we are really relying on the community and your feedback to understand what you need and what you have. So if you believe that you have a tool that would be interesting for others to use, or if you are using our tools and you find some bugs or uh, problems, please let us know. We have a message board, we are actively reading it, and we are uh, driving our development based on what we hear from you and what we think is interesting for the community. After the uh, webinars last week on QOFAM and the EUQ, we received a couple of very good feedback and responses. So I hope that you will also be actively responding and providing uh, some uh, opinions about today's lecture, lecture, today's webinar, and uh, your experience with the tool. All right, so that was the introduction about SimCenter and what we are doing. And now let's see uh, the PBE application. We will look at the interface of the PBE application first. I will explain how it works for those who have not been with us last week. And then I will go through settings for a, a hazard style and a FEMA P58 style loss assessment in the application. Uh, you will see that uh, there is not a lot of differences in some of the settings between Hazus and FEMA P58. So even if you are uh, only interested in FEMA P58 style, more or higher fidelity loss assessment, I encourage you to pay attention to the Hazus one because I'm only highlighting parts that are used by both in that case. And then I will show you examples uh, for both cases uh, that are provided to you in those uh, zip files online and also show you one important feature uh, related to using external EDP data. So if you have your own response simulation analysis, you can bring in those EDPs and use the PBE tool only for the loss assessment part, if that's what you are interested in. So as I mentioned, our tools use the same look and feel across all of them. So it's always the same uh, navigation that you need to use. So if you have been using one of our tools, you can probably use all of our tools already. We have the workflow depicted here on the left side in this input panel selection uh, part. So we go from uncertainty quantification through response simulation, and now we have damage and loss here, and then the results in the end. You, for each step, you can you can specify the inputs on this input panel. This is take, takes up most of the real estate of the application. And then if you have any issues like errors or, or there, there is something happening that we would like you to know about, then you will get a message here at the top message area. This login button is used for logging into a, a remote server, typically design safe, if you want to run uh, remote calculations. And then these push buttons are used to run the analysis or to communicate with design safe or exit the application. It's really quite simple, I believe. Now, let's see how you can set up a typical uh, loss assessment workflow. And then after reviewing it here uh, through the slides, we will also do a demo and then uh, I will show you how to do it in the application. So until the loss assessment step, everything is related to response simulation. So most of those, or all of those to be exact, have been covered last week. So I will refer to the particular tool training that provides more information, and I encourage you to check those videos or check those slides if you are interested in those details. And I assume that most of you are interested in damage and losses today, so I'm not going to go into detailed explanations about the other parts. One uh, important difference between EEUQ and PBE 
is that in PBE, we are only providing forward propagation when it comes to uncertainty quantification. So say sensitivity or reliability are not available here. But among forward propagation methods, there are several uh, available, not only Latin hypertube sampling. So check out this uh, webinar if you want to see what other methods uh, uh, Dakota or Quoham provides. Now, in the general information tab, there are some pieces of information that are more important than others. So these are the ones that I highlighted. This is mostly uh, metadata that you provide uh, about the analysis. Like the building name is, for example, not used for anything. It's just for you to, to recognize which building you are looking at. But the number of stories is going to be very important for loss assessment. So you, you want to make sure that this number is the same number that you use in your simulation model and also the one that you use in your performance model for the loss assessment. So in this case, we are looking at a three-story building. That's why I have three here. The other important detail here is the units. We support both uh, standard units and uh, imperial units. So you are not limited in that sense, but make sure that whatever you chose here is consistently used uh, for, the, for every step in the analysis and you provide everything in these units. Finally, the location is important for certain parts or depending on the type of analysis you do. If you do ground motion record selection and based on a site specific hazard, as we will do in this example, then you wanna be sure that this location is appropriate for your site. Uh, if you do some other methods, then you might not need to worry about this too much. When it comes to the simulation model, I'm using the example that Frank uh, McKenna showed you last uh, Wednesday. So it was part one of the EEUQ tool training. This is from Professor Chopra's Dynamics of, uh, of Structures book. And uh, he showed you, uh, Frank showed you three different random variables introduced in this example. So we have a three-story building and the floor and roof weight and the floor stiffnesses are random variables. Everything else is uh, described in this table. The event was uh, introduced in detail in the second part of the EUQ training. In this case, we are using a uniform hazard spectrum from USGS based on the site and some other details that I provided. And we are doing a ground motion record selection using the peer NGA uh, ground motion record database and their web service. And as you can see, I selected 20 records and I provided some other uh, uh, conditions for the selection here. So we get 20 records and here you can see uh, the records displayed with their mean and also with the target spectrum. So we are going to use these 20 ground motions on this three-story building to get a response estimation. The analysis uh, settings can be uh, changed or edited in the next step. We are not doing much of a change here except for adjusting the damping to be 5% because uh, our uniform hazard spectrum and all the, all the records are based on those 5% uh, damping. So this way we are in line with those assumptions there. Again, part one of the EEUQ tool training provides you more information about what, are, what is possible here and all the different damping options that we provide. Okay, finally, we need to specify details of the random variables. You can see that we have the three random variables automatically picked up from the simulation model. So we have the weights for the roof and the floor, and then we have the stiffness for the uh, stories. The distributions are uh, log normal and normal here. We have uh, some other distributions available, and these numbers are picked up from the previous example. Uh, I encourage you to look at this training if you are interested in more details about the random variables. And finally, we arrived at the loss assessment part. So when you get here, assume that uh, the simulations are going to be automatically carried out. The response is described by engineering demand parameters. So that means uh, floor accelerations 
uh, interstory drifts and roof drifts are available. And then at this point, you specify what to do with those EDPs to get to uh, damage and loss estimates. Now, this one, this uh, input panel corresponds to hazards. So this is a simpler uh, example. And I thought that it would be better to start with this one. You can see that at the first uh, uh, part in the first group, we can provide some information about the kind of EDP handling we would like to uh, do. In this case, we, we say that we need a multivariate log normal distribution fit to the uh, response data. So we have 20 ground motions, we will have 20 EDPs, and we fit a distribution to those 20 EDPs. And then we will resample that to get 10,000 EDP samples that we will use for the loss assessment. This is pretty standard FEMA P58 uh, approach to uh, increasing the number of samples available for loss uh, damage and loss assessment. I will talk more about what other options are available here tomorrow when we go into the details. This uh, part handles the additional uncertainty that we consider in the analysis. So after fitting a distribution to the EDPs, we can increase the logarithmic standard deviation of that distribution to consider uncertainties that were not part of the simulation. Typically, this is used to consider either ground motion or modeling uncertainties. Now we will say that the ground motions are less uncertain. So most of that uncertainty is captured by the records that we have chosen. But the modeling uncertainty is uh, quite easy to argue that it is uh, significant considering that we have a stick model for this building. So I bumped it up to 0.3. Uh, the second column here corresponds to the damage model. So we started with the response and then we go from response all the way to the losses. In the second case, we have the damage. So we need to, in, in hazards, it's quite simple. We need to specify a structure type and the design level. I specify the steel moment frame here and the moderate code design. So that's something like uh, from, the, from the 1970s, say. You can easily change these as you will see in the demo. The last thing you need to specify to, to identify the configuration, the building configuration that we are working with in hazards is the occupancy type. In this case, I chose a commercial uh, retail building. So we have a three-story steel moment, moment frame from the 1970s that is used for commercial purposes in this case. You can cherry pick which uh, decision variables you are interested in. This can reduce the amount of input uh, outputs and can also make the analysis slightly faster. Unless you are really not interested in one of these decision variables, there's not much reason to uh, check these, uh, to uncheck these boxes because the, the simulation time is not going to change that much. Finally, I wanted to talk about these ones here. So replacement cost, replacement time, and the peak population are all one in this example. If you provide ones for a hazard assessment, what you're going to get is a normalized uh, repair cost and normalized casualties, which you can use to connect to whatever repair cost estimation you have, or sometimes people have uh, different uh, values for the population depending on the time of the day and they want to control this. This is an easy way to do that kind of post-processing because it provides you a normalized value. If you provide actual replacement cost and actual population, then of course you will get back uh, the expected repair cost and the expected uh, casualties appropriately. I did not talk about the detection limits and I did not talk about these custom uh, options here. These are advanced topics that I will cover tomorrow. So now let's see uh, an example with a hazard assessment. I will pull up the PBE tool. You can see that here. This is how it uh, starts. Now, if you go to file open, you can open the assessment that I prepared for you so that you don't have to uh, put all uh, the data in that I have just shown in the presentation. So you just click on open. And then you can see that we are looking at 20 samples. It's a three-story building located on uh, 
if you check this out, this is actually the Stanford campus. Uh, Three-story building, you can see the random variables that we have just looked at. And now we are going to pull in the records from the peer and GA database. This might take a minute or two because we need to uh, connect to the web service and wait for the records to arrive. And then we will run the loss assessment for uh, hazards. Yeah, there you go. You can see that this is quite convenient. And if you change these settings, you get different records, obviously. So as I mentioned, we have 5% damping. We have these random variables. And the settings are exactly as I described in the presentation. Just a comment here, we have tooltips for every piece here. So if you don't know what this means, you can always read these tooltips and you get a better idea. And to help you selecting, select the right building, if you are not familiar with Hazus, uh, language here, you can just hover over and you can see what each of these mean. Same thing for occupancy and codes. Okay, so we are running 10,000 samples using those uh, 20 EDPs that we get from the ground motions, and it should take about a minute or so, maybe less. And then I will show you how the results are displayed in the application and also. Uh, the additional results, I would call them the raw results that are available uh, in, the in the folder where the calculations are actually performed. It shouldn't take more than a couple of seconds. Here we go. Okay, so let's start with the summary tab. You can see that there are decision variables listed in the vertical axis. So we have collapse that gives you the probability of collapse. These are the top damage states from structural components and two types of non-structural components, acceleration sensitive and uh, drift sensitive non-structural components. These are specific to hazards. You don't get these in uh, a FEMA P58 type assessments because there you have much more uh, component types. This uh, line checks for excessive repair cost. That means, is the repair cost more than the replacement cost? If it's more than that, then the building will be replaced rather than repaired. And you can see how the fraction of the cases when this occurred. This is the repair cost. We get normalized values because we, we fed in uh, a replacement cost of 1.0. So this means that on average, in this case, we expect that 38% of the building replacement cost will need to be paid for repair. That's quite significant, but we are looking at a 2,500 year event 10 miles from the San Andreas Fault. So this might actually happen. Uh, this is the repair time in days and the four levels of injuries and the expected number of such injuries. Again, this is a normalized value, so it needs to be multiplied by the population in the building to get the expected number of casualties or fatalities, depending on which level of injury you are looking at. Now, these are some high level statistics, mean and standard deviation. And then you also have a description of the distribution by looking at uh, the minimum, the maximum, the 10th and 90th percentile and the median value. So you can see how, how close it is to a normal distribution or how skewed the distribution is towards one side or the other. If you want to know more, the first step is to go to data values. And here you get a, a powerful plotting tool that we have already demonstrated last week. You have the different data input here at the bottom in uh, different columns. You have all 10,000 here. So if you want, you can review them, but I do not recommend it. It's easier to just plot these values. So for example, if you want to see the repair cost for each realization, you can right click on the uh, number of sample the, or the sample ID number, for example, that will give that will make it uh, plotted in the horizontal axis. And you can left click on the repair cost that will plot it on the vertical axis. So now we can see something about this. But oftentimes you want to see 
the marginal distribution that, that tells you much more. So then you can right click on the repair cost and this gives you a CDF or you can left click again and that gives you a histogram of the repair cost. And we can see that in Hazus, because there are not many uh, components, we get a much less uh, unimodal distribution. We have these distinct modes here that correspond to the few damage states of the few components usually. We can plot join distributions as well. So if you are interested in, let's say, repair cost versus repair time, then you get this. Again, you can see that we have a very sparsely populated space here because of the small number of components. This will look much more interesting in uh, FEMA P58 style analysis. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that we are running uh, a temporal uh, model for the population. Uh, in both the Hazus and the FEMA P58 case. So if I plot, for example, the hour of the day and the number of inhabitants, then you can see that since this is an office or retail building, most of the people are there in the middle of the day and we don't really have much of a population during the night. So this is simulated during the loss assessment and then the injuries are calculated accordingly. All right. So one more thing before we go back to the presentation if you go to file and preferences then you can see the local jobs directory this is the directory where your simulations are run if you go to that directory as i'm going to do it now uh, not this one this one. So if you go to that directory, you will see a TempSim Center folder. And within that, these are the files that were generated during the response estimation. And then all of these CSV files are the results of the loss estimation. So although we show you some results in the application, there is much more available in these CSV files. And I will go more uh, into the details of these files and which file contains what type of uh, results tomorrow. I just want you to know that if you want to do this at scale, if you want to do more powerful post-processing, you do not need to worry about how these results are saved from the application because the application only loads a small portion of these files and you have all of these available. So you can load these in MATLAB or Python or whichever scripting language you use or even excel if that's what you would like to use okay so let's go back to the presentation yeah. here and then let's see what happens if we switch here at the top to fema p58 you can see that the layout is very similar we have a couple of uh, new uh, fields that were not there in Hazus, but the response model, for example, is exactly the same. So let's start with this side. The, in the loss model case, we cannot do the same thing that we did with Hazus and provide only ones here. That's not going to work very well for FEMA P58. We need to use realistic values. Otherwise, we will run into problems with uh, the repair cost being much more than the replacement cost. And then uh, in all of the simulations, the result will be that it's more uh, economical to replace than to repair. So make sure you use realistic values for these costs and times, and also for the peak population in this case. These parts are advanced topics. So I will cover irreparable residual drift and collapses and the different ways to calculate collapses uh, in the PBE tool. Right now in this example, notice that we have a prescribed collapse probability of zero. So that means that the results we see are conditioned on no collapse. There are other options available that I'm going to cover tomorrow. The second tab here under FEMA P58 is uh, where you can specify the performance model. This is not even available in hazards because the performance model is uh, easily conditioned 
on the type of uh, structure and on the design uh, era that you can select there in the general tab. But for Pima P58, you need to specify often tens or dozens of, of uh, different components. And this is what's handled on this tab. You can see, if you look at this example, that I'm only, uh, I only selected three components for this case because I wanted it to be simple and uh, run quickly. And tomorrow we will go deeper into how these work. We have a default database that you can ex export and overwrite uh, any part of the fragility curves or consequence functions that you wish. We allow you to prepare performance models in CSV files and load them into the application or save the ones that you prepared to CSV files. And here you, can, you will be able to specify the location and direction of each component, their quantities, and their distributions. So we will go into this uh, topic in more detail tomorrow. The collapse modes and dependencies are also something related only to injuries uh, and collapses. So since we have no collapses today, uh, I'm leaving that for tomorrow. All right, so let's see how the FEMA P58 case works. What we are doing here is simply opening an analysis that says P58 assessment. And then the beginning is exactly the same. Since we are pulling records from the peer NGA, we might need to run this again. I'm not sure if it preserves it now that I loaded another input, but we will see that. Same thing, same thing here. And then for damage and loss, you can see that I reduced the realizations to 5,000. Just to run it a bit quicker, it should work up until probably 100,000 cases. And uh, we have zero here. These are not one, as I mentioned. And then for the components, you can see that under selected components, we have three of them. For each, we can have a short description of what it is, some information about the component, and then the different groups that I predefined for you. You can see that we have a wall partition, we have a curtain wall, and a pre-north ridge beam column joint in this case. So you know, don't expect these loss results to be uh, realistic because we are missing a lot of important components from the building. But I believe that these demonstrate how the tool works. If you want to add more components, you have the full FEMA P58 list here. And then you can select any of them and just add selected if you would like to play with this today. OK, so everything is set up. We can run the analysis. Again, this might take some time. And one thing that we are going to do here, I just go there to show you how it works. You can see that it's running right now. The new working directories are created as I speak. And this is still the response estimation part. And as soon as we get to 20, we have enough responses and then uh, loss assessment starts. Now, oftentimes you run the response estimation and then you want to test out different settings for the loss assessment. You can see that most of the time is taken by running the response estimation. In this case, you see the loss assessment is already completed and you see the results on the right side. So to help you with this and to save you time, we provide you a response.csv here. If you open this up, you see that this gives a list of the random variables that were used. So for each of the 20 realizations, you have the sample for the random variables, you have the ground motion record number, and then you have the EDPs that were calculated. I will talk about this nomenclature that we use here, but basically you can take this file without any modification, copy it, and then feed it into the PBE tool so that you don't need to run this simulation again if you only want to change things in the loss assessment. You can also create a file using your own simulations that are completely independent of PBE. If you provide it in the same format, it should be able to read it and run the loss assessment uh, without the need for any previous steps. So I'm going to demonstrate that. 
in a second. I just want to show you that you know these results actually make sense. So we have a different uh, set of decision variables because this is a P58 style analysis. And then again, I can plot just this one to show you. This is a repair cost versus repair time uh, plot. You can see that there is much more granularity to this than, than the hazardous one. So let's go back to the damage and loss panel. And then here in the EDP data, we can choose a CSV file. And now I'm going to go to this TAMSIM center folder that where we have just been and choose this response CSV uh, file. Uh, wait, that, if I choose that file from that folder, it's not going to work because as soon as I start running the analysis, part of the initialization process is that it removes everything from this folder. So I actually copied this file uh, here and it's part of your example package. So let's choose it from there. Believe me, it's the same file. So response CSV, if you choose any file here, then the application will know that you don't want to run the previous steps. So when I click run, it will focus only on the loss assessment and it should be much faster because there's no need for response simulation in this case. Yes, there you go. So similar results. Of course, there is some uh, you know, variance here because we are running a probabilistic analysis, but just to show you, you know, the same plot looks very similar. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. I've just shown you how to do this and then showed you a demo. And at this point, I think I will finish my talk. I have a couple of exercises uh, for you. If you are interested in trying the tool, you can uh, try these uh, steps with the hazards assessment, or you can try these others with the P58 assessment. If you can complete these little exercises, I believe that you are good to go for tomorrow. You are prepared to use the tool and uh, we can talk about the more advanced settings then. If you run into any trouble, please come to our office hours. I am very happy to help you figure out what went wrong. And with that, I thank you. And I am looking forward to any questions that you might have. I believe we have 10 more minutes. Thank you, Adam. Um, so as Matt put in the chat window, if you want have any questions, you need to post them in, in the chat window, um, send them to the moderator or myself. I do have one question in Adam. Yeah. Somebody, who, somebody who's looking at the QuoFam tool wanted to know why in the summary results, instead of showing the kurtosis and skewness, you show different measures, like the, the, the low, the 10%, yeah. the mean. Here, right? Do I have, I don't have a figure for that, but I go to the tool. So this one, right? Yeah, it was just, I guess the comment you made was that the, um, you can figure out how skewed the thing is just from looking at the numbers. Yeah, so, so I believe that uh, having the minimum and the maximum, for example, is, is an important thing to know what is the range of values. The kurtosis and skewness wouldn't tell you that. And another thing that you get here, which you wouldn't necessarily get, uh, is this 10th and 90th percentile that is specifically of interest for, for uh, many people who are doing loss assessment, the 90th percentile in particular. That's the probable maximum loss, as they call it. And uh, people are often interested in this one. So I could, if, if you are interested, I could add, besides the standard deviation, there could be a skewness and kurtosis here. But I see that very rarely uh, of interest for, for these types of decision variable results. I think the, the percentiles are, are more often used. But let me know if, if you are interested. That there's really, it's not a big deal to put it in there. Or if anybody wants to make a feature request to the QuoFem and have this in QuoFem, we could also do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. is, is there any other questions coming in here? Here's one. <laughs> I guess somebody else is looking at the tools. Um, so you save the results in Workter. In EUQ, mm -hmm. in EUQ, they are saved in documents folder. Okay. Um, yeah. So 
I, I, I understand. Oh, wait, let's keep it this way. So if you go to preferences, this is how I set it up because I just hate to go to the documents folder. It's so buried in there. But the default is this. I believe it's something like local work there. So okay. if you set it up like that, then it will be saved in that directory. That's how it starts when you when you start the tool. But if you click on browse or if you just replace it here, then you can you can set it up for any directory that you like. Okay. And I happen to have a work there, and that's that's where I put it. That's all. So, uh, so if the participants are running the this tool later, they can look. They should look in the documents folder for the, the results. Yeah, or they should just okay. look at these preferences, and they will see, and they okay. can they can adjust if they wish. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, here's a very general one. <laughs> Hazus versus P58. Could you briefly explain the difference? Oh, wow. Yeah, briefly. So briefly, P58 is a more atomic approach. You have a bunch of components. And for each component, you provide a quantity at different locations in the building. So it really it requires a lot of information about the building. If you have that information, it will provide you a more uh, higher fidelity result and a, and a better understanding of the losses in the building. If you don't have that information, then your, your results are going to be high resolution, but might be heavily biased. So you have to be careful with P58. I think it's a great tool, but you need to know a lot about the building. Hazus, on the other hand, if we, if we go there, you know, you don't have a component tab here because it doesn't use that many components. You have three types of components. You have a structural and two types of non-structural, as I mentioned uh, in the demo. So all you need to do is, you know, the structure type, which is one of, I believe, 20 or, or 30 types. For example, this is, a, this is a wooden building. These are steel buildings, concrete. Uh, reinforced masonry, unreinforced masonry, and so on. So you, you provide the structure type, you provide one of the four uh, code levels, and that's it. It's much easier to obtain that information. So you can avoid having this bias that you might have with FEMA P58 because you don't know anything about the building. But in return, the results will be at a much lower resolution because what you get is basically a building level uh, loss and you cannot really tell if the losses are driven by uh, a certain floor or a certain type of component uh, that is uh, that is just not available in hazards in this type of assessment so if this is a building level and the, the fema p58 is a component level or assembly uh, level assessment i think that's the main difference okay and one further question here is what options do we have for demand generation except for log normal? Okay, so this is this is something we will talk a little bit about tomorrow, but let's let's see now. So we have empirical. That means that I will use whatever you provide, and I'm not going to fit anything to it. This is a very flexible uh, option because basically you can do any kind of fitting, resampling before you provide those EDPs, and then. Uh, I will just take them as is. If you choose log normal, then, then it's going to be a multivariate log normal distribution. And if you choose truncated log normal, that means I consider that you have some detection limits and I consider that you have some collapse limits. And basically, uh, the detection limits describe uh, interstory drift and full acceleration values beyond which you don't trust your simulation model. And the collapse limits describe these values beyond which you consider the building collapsed. And when I fit a distribution, I consider the samples that go beyond the detection limits as uh, censored. And I consider everything that goes beyond this as invalid. So basically, I fit a log normal distribution that is truncated at the top at the collapse limit level. Doing this in a multivariate sense can be 
tricky and you need to really understand what you are doing to make sure that the results make sense. But uh, yeah, it's available. I will talk a little bit about the caveats uh, tomorrow and show you a couple of figures that might help uh, understand it better. Another thing that we have here uh, to have a complete explanation, say that you choose log normal, you can switch between all results and non-collapse results. So oftentimes your analysis will provide you a lot of EDPs that have say 30% 30, 30 drift. Now in most buildings, 30% drift is collapse. So you can provide a collapse limit here. In this case, I say 15%. And if you choose non-collapse results, then when I'm fitting the distribution, I'm only fitting it to the results that are below this collapse limit. So this allows you to filter out the results that are collapsed ones. And then if you choose estimated collapse here, they will automatically be used to have an estimated probability of collapse instead of prescribing a value at the beginning of the analysis. So you see that this, this is a pretty complex thing and we will, we will talk more about that tomorrow. But these are the options in a nutshell. So I have no more questions and we're also up against the end of the hour. So again, thank you, Adam, for the pre presentation and thank you all participants for um, sticking with us through this. Um, again, you, we will talk again tomorrow at, we'll start around 10 again, Berkeley time. Um, so thanks and welcome tomorrow. And oh, by the way, before you leave, do come to the office hours later if you're having problems running these examples. We do encourage you to Try the tool out for yourselves um, in the next few hours just to make sure you can actually regenerate what Adam's presented here. It's actually quite beneficial if you start looking at the tool. Um, and then when you come back this afternoon, if you've got questions or queries about how it works or suggestions on what you would do differently, um, you can let us know. So we'll talk to you all, well, some of you later at two. Thank you very much.